1977, two spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, launched into the unknown. Today, more than four decades later, they're still alive, still sending faint whispers back to Earth from the edge of interstellar space. How is that possible? Their solar panels would have frozen useless decades ago. Their batteries would have long run dry. The answer is nuclear power. Specifically, plutonium-238, packed into nuclear batteries called RTGs. The system that you can see here, the multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator, that produces a little over 100 watts, 110 watts, at the beginning of a mission. The systems ranged from about 100 watts with the multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator to about 300 watts, which was the general purpose heat source, RTG, radioisotope thermoelectric generator, that was used on Cassini, and Galileo and Ulysses, and also New Horizons. Now imagine a new generation of spacecraft, not just lasting 40 years, but 100, maybe even 200 years. Missions that don't just explore planets, but drift endlessly between stars, powered by a tiny pellet of radioactive fuel that outlives entire civilizations. That's the promise of americium. Yes, americium. The same stuff that's hiding inside your smoke detector. Americium might take over from plutonium as the power source for spacecraft. And that has serious consequences for the future of exploration. Because the next giant leap for humanity might depend on something smaller than a speck of dust. Let's start with the simple question. Why not just use solar panels everywhere in space? Solar panels are great near Earth. They power the International Space Station, satellites, and even some Mars missions. But beyond Mars, sunlight becomes too weak. At Jupiter, it's 25 times dimmer than Earth. By the time you reach Pluto, sunlight is about a thousand times weaker. If Voyager had relied on solar panels, it would have needed wings bigger than a football field. Instead, it carried something the size of a trash can, an RTG. An RTG, or radioisotope thermoelectric generator, doesn't rely on sunlight. It works by harnessing the heat released from radioactive decay. Inside it is a fuel pellet, typically plutonium-238. As the atoms decay, they give off heat. The heat is converted into electricity using thermocouples. No moving parts, no maintenance, just steady power for decades. Voyager's three RTGs each held almost 5 kilograms of plutonium-238. They launched in 1977, generating about 470 watts of power. Today, nearly 50 years later, they're still producing over 200 watts. That's enough to keep critical instruments alive, even as NASA scientists shut down systems one by one to stretch the mission's life. Think about this. Voyager's nuclear batteries will still be warm and glowing when the pyramids of Egypt are twice as old as they are today. How's that for long-term energy? So why plutonium-238? It's not the plutonium in bombs. In a nuclear reactor, you have a controlled reaction that occurs by the moderation of neutrons that are emitted by the fuel that causes fission events, which creates more neutrons, which creates more fission events, and you get a cascading reaction. And that's how you harness the power. In a radioisotope power system, it's simply a radioactive material that's undergoing its natural decay process. So there's no chance for it to go uh, critical. There's no chance for it to produce more power or, or go into one of the other states that you might consider with a reactor, like a meltdown scenario or something like that. It can't, it can't do that. Plutonium-238 has a half-life of 88 years, long enough to power spacecraft for decades, but short enough to release useful energy. Plutonium first went into space in 1969. They started small as satellite systems and then they got bigger and they got more ambitious. NASA started to see how it could be useful. You could have a power system on the moon, which is which will, those systems were sent up on the Apollo missions. You could produce deep space probes that could send back data for decades. Pioneer was one of the first ones that went out to Jupiter to explore that as a possible as a possible mission. And then we got bigger and more ambitious, and we get to Voyager, Curiosity, Cassini, Galileo, and many other missions like that. 
Apollo missions carried small RTGs called SNAP-27s, which were left on the moon to power seismic and science stations. Even after the astronauts left, the experiments continued to run for years thanks to their tiny plutonium cores. Cassini, which orbited Saturn from 2004 to 2017, carried 33 kilograms of PU-238 in its RTGs. Without it, Cassini could never have survived the 13 years in Saturn's dark, cold orbit, returning 450,000 images and rewriting our understanding of the Saturnian system. Unfortunately, we're running out of the fuel that powers space exploration. We're revolutionizing space. We're doing things differently. Investing in our ideas and innovations to prove and deploy new capabilities faster than ever. Advancing space exploration with new business models and proven technology. Powering a lunar economy and deep space travel. We're shaping the future to make history again. Here's the catch. PU-238 doesn't exist naturally. It has to be manufactured. During the Cold War, the US and Soviet Union produced it as part of their nuclear weapons program. By the time the Cold War ended, the US had a stockpile large enough to support decades of space missions. But now, that stockpile is almost gone. By the early 2000s, NASA was on the brink of cancelling missions because there wasn't enough fuel left. Curiosity's RTG in 2012 used some of the last major supplies. Restarting production hasn't been easy. In fact, it wasn't until 2015 that Oak Ridge National Laboratory produced the first new plutonium in decades. Even now, the US only makes a few hundred grams per year. Think about that. A single deep space mission might need five kilograms or more. At current production rates, NASA can't support ambitious new missions and keep up existing commitments. This is why agencies are seeking alternatives. Enter a surprising candidate, americium. Americium is one of those strange elements created by human hands. It was discovered in 1944 at the height of the Manhattan Project. The most useful isotope for space is americium-241. It has a half-life of 432 years, nearly five times longer than plutonium-238. That means an americium-powered battery could outlive entire space agencies. Here's the clever part. Americium-241 is actually a byproduct of plutonium production. As plutonium-241 decays, it turns into americium-241. That means we can harvest it from nuclear waste. Instead of building new reactors to produce plutonium, we can extract it from existing nuclear stockpiles. It's recycling, on a cosmic scale. So one of the things that makes americium 241 a little bit unique in terms of gritty isotopes that have been used historically is the fact that um, it is quite abundant. Especially in the UK, we have a lot of civil nuclear waste from our old reprocessing facilities where we used to reprocess uh, civil nuclear fuel. Within that civil nuclear fuel, uh, there is actually an abundance of americium 241, which has been uh, growing as a byproduct of that civil nuclear waste for a long time. So the, attractive, the attractiveness of americium is both one in which it's a sustainable aspect. So we have a byproduct of, of nuclear waste, which we can utilize to do these exciting science missions. Um, and the second aspect is the fact that it does have a longer half-life uh, than other historic isotopes that have been used. So for really long duration missions, so if you think back to the days of your Voyager or even uh, a little bit more recent, the New Horizons mission, which went to Pluto, which was about uh, more than nine years. It allows you to have a more constant power source to deliver you that power that you need once you get to that interesting uh, planetary body or interesting uh, piece of uh, explorative science that you want to do uh, in the solar system or beyond. So let's compare the two power sources. Plutonium-238, half-life 88 years. Very hot, compact, but scarce and expensive. Americium-241, half-life 432 years. Less heat per gram, bulkier RTGs, but abundant and easier to source. 
If plutonium is a high-performance sports car, fast, powerful, but expensive, americium is the family sedan. Slower, less flashy, but reliable, affordable, and built to last. Plutonium-238 is still considered to be the isotope of choice for RPS. It's got a higher power density, it's safe, it's chemically stable, it's insoluble, produces a little over a half a watt per gram of material. Americium has a lower thermal density, so it's down to about 0.1 watt per gram. And so that's almost a factor of five difference. So plutonium is still considered to be the best material, but it's not readily available to the public. In the radioisotope power systems program for NASA, we produce plutonium for planetary needs, science needs, exploration needs, but we produce it on an as needed basis. The choice of fuel depends on the mission. Take curiosity or perseverance. They need to power drills, lasers, cameras, computers, and high gain antennas. They demand watts, hundreds of them. That's plutonium territory. But think about a probe designed to measure slow geological changes on an icy moon, or a tiny instrument drifting for centuries in interstellar space. It doesn't need much power. Just a trickle. That's where americium wins. This isn't science fiction. The first americium-powered spacecraft is already being designed. The University of Leicester in the UK has been at the forefront of developing americium RTGs for more than a decade. Their labs are working with the European Space Agency and the UK Space Agency to create both full-sized RTGs and smaller radioisotope heater units, little nuclear warmers to keep instruments alive on icy worlds. Meanwhile, NASA's Glenn Research Center continues to refine plutonium RTGs. The US wants to ensure plutonium remains viable, but Europe views americium as the path to independence. One big focus is ESA's upcoming missions. The Rosalind Franklin Mars rover, designed initially with Russian power systems, had to pivot after geopolitics cut off collaboration. Americium power units are one way Europe hopes to avoid dependency in the future. When man eventually embarks on a mission to Mars, americium will most likely be partly powering the way. Missions to, to Mars with humans on board, they're actually going to need a combination of, of, of power systems and power sources. Uh, because from one aspect, one thing that's really important is just heat. Us humans, we, uh, we like to stay in a, in a comfortable temperature range. Uh, and of course, in a three-year journey, that's quite a considerable amount of heat that we're going to need to, to be able to provide to, to keep humans alive. So there's going to be a, a need for a combination of things from radioisotope power to deliver heat and electrical power. But they'll also need bigger power systems like fission reactors and things like that to, to really make uh, that kind of uh, mission concept work. Americium is attractive for three reasons. Supply, longevity, strategic independence. With americium, nations like those in Europe can power their own missions without relying on US plutonium. NASA has been studying a mission concept called the Interstellar Probe. The spacecraft would travel 150 billion kilometers from Earth into the uncharted interstellar medium. That's 20 times further than Voyager. For such a mission, you'd want a power source that lasts not decades, but centuries. That's americium's sweet spot. However, americium isn't a perfect solution. Because of the lower power density, it means that everything has to get bigger, or your systems have to get smaller. If we wanted to make a 100 watt americium system, we're going to need five times more americium to make the same amount of power. The advantage to americium is in small systems. You can afford to pay a little bit of a mass penalty for that small system, because if you try to build a large system, it's gonna become very, very large, very, very hard to use. That's a problem for rockets where every kilogram counts. That's why research is focused on reimagining the 200-year-old concept of the Stirling engine. The Stirling converter, couples a Stirling engine with an alternator. So we've got a uh, regenerative closed cycle uh, heat engine, which is uh, using a enclosed working fluid that is cyclically expanding and contracting, moving a piston. That moving piston is taking heat and turning it into mechanical work. We can then take that mechanical work, 
and turn it into electrical energy by an alternator. So what we effectively have is a closed system and that's really important because if you think about your car engine, that's also a heat engine turning heat into mechanical work, but it's an open cycle. So you have to use the air, you have to exhaust your, your, your waste gases. We can't do that in the hard back of the space. So we need a closed cycle system. And while the ESA has made enormous progress, americium RTGs don't yet have the proven track record of plutonium. Until they fly, questions remain. However, the outlook is positive, and the Stirling engine has the potential to revolutionize how we power spacecraft. So historically, uh, actually, the thing that's been utilized the most is what we call uh, thermoelectrics. So it's a solid state, uh, highly doped semiconductor, which directly converts uh, that heat into electrical uh, energy. And that's great because in space, we, we want high reliability. So moving parts always start to make us a little bit nervous, as you can imagine. But the downside with the thermoelectrics is the low conversion efficiency. So typically you're only in the kind of 5% conversion efficiency for thermoelectrics, whereas Stirling engines, heat engines, uh, uh, they have the potential to actually produce, you know, 25% conversion efficiency or greater. So what that allows us to do is either generate more electrical power from the same uh, amount of, of, of radioisotope or take less radioisotope. So it's, 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 quite trans it's a quite transformative piece of technology, but it's never flown for uh, because, again, of this aspect of, of moving parts generally means uh, less reliability. Uh, however, though, the project has been, been working on demonstrating that reliability via being able to operate even with a failed uh, Stirling engine. To address the reliability issue in space, the Leicester team is working on a power plant using multiple Stirling converters. And so one of the advantages that we found with Amaricium 241 was because of the long half-life and the more constant heat that's being generated from the heat source, we can actually uh, build generators utilizing more Stirling converters. And so what that means is if we fail one of the Stirling converters, we're still able to produce the same amount of power from the system or near about the same amount of power from the system. So from a reliability aspect, that's, that's really beneficial. For decades, the US tightly controlled plutonium-238 production and supply. That gave NASA a monopoly on deep space missions. Europe, Russia and China had to either rely on solar or abandon some mission ideas. By developing americium RTGs, Europe is carving out independence. If we have a healthy americium supply chain, there is a place for both plutonium and americium, but it does not exist yet. If we build a higher conversion efficiency system, like the one that the University of Leicester is developing, that can make more power for an americium system. If then we adopt that higher conversion efficiency and use it with plutonium, then we can get even higher power. So in the low power regime, there's a good place for americium. In the high-power regime, there's a good place for plutonium. It's not just in space where americium could become a power source. There are uh, applications here on Earth that can be used. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, you know, it's, it's applications where you require uh, power in very remote regions. So you, know, you, can, you can imagine that there are a lot of defense applications which require power in very remote regions for communications or various things like that. Um, there are other applications such as uh, uh, deep sea exploration. Uh, historically, systems have been have been developed for that, uh, and that's that's a that's a really key one. For decades, plutonium powered humanity's boldest journeys to Saturn, to Pluto, and to interstellar space. But as our ambitions grow bigger and longer, we may need a new fuel. Americium could be that future. It may not burn as brightly, but it lasts far longer. And in exploration, endurance often matters more than speed. So, the next time you hear the quiet beep of a smoke detector, remember, the same element saving lives in your home could one day power a probe traveling to another star or even the ocean depths. In the end, the race to explore the universe may not be about rockets or telescopes, but about who controls the fuel to power them.